Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Music Den. I'm your host, Armando Venditti. I want to welcome you all back to episode four of This Left Turn Feels Right. This is where I take a look at a list of artists who at one point during their career decided to record one, maybe two albums in a different music genre than what they were known for otherwise. In some cases, enjoying varying degrees of success with these decisions, and in other cases, pretty much dealing with the consequences and fallout from these decisions. Now, in another episode, I did say how there are artists out there who, throughout the course of their career, from album to album, have jumped from genre to genre. And the artist I'm about to talk about today is no exception. That artist is David Bowie. Now, David Bowie is a very interesting case to take a look at for this series. Because pretty much from his start in 1967 to 2016 when he passed, Bowie never liked to define the type of music he did. Whenever he was asked by journalists to define the kind of music that he wrote and performed, he never wanted to classify it. He would either avoid the question or he would just say David Bowie. Okay, again, not wanting to pigeonhole himself into a certain type of music genre. It is worthy to make two points here. It's worthy to note, number one, that during the course of his career, David Bowie had released 26 studio albums. Okay, point number two, David Bowie's rise to fame and stardom, quote unquote, didn't happen overnight. Okay, it took several years and several f- false starts in you know for his career to get going. He went as far as to even record a children's album called The Laughing Gnome in the 60s. And it wasn't until his fourth release in 71 that things started to happen for Bowie as a solo artist. His first three releases, self-titled in 67, Space Oddity in 69, and The Man Who Sold the World in 1970, had modest success. Uh, First of all, self-titled in 1967 contained the single Love You Till Tuesday, and that album pretty much came and went without any notice. Space Oddity, which was released in 69, had the single... Space Audi, the title track. Uh, that track was seen by some people as pretty much a novelty single due to the subject matter of the song. And it was a hit in the UK, but in the US it made little to no uh, mark on the charts. It was re-released again in 1973 as a single due to the success of his uh, work as Ziggy Stardust. And The Man Who Sold the World, as you can tell, I put up the graphic of the UK and European album cover with him and the dress sitting on the settee. That album, produced by Tony Visconti, was more of a heavier rock album featuring such songs as the title track, which Nirvana would go on to have a hit with in 1994. And such songs as Width of a Circle, heavy track featuring major heavy guitar work from Mick Ronson, and the single Black Country Rock. Black Country Rock, for me, is not one of my favorite songs. I I honestly cannot even stand to listen to it. At this point, again, he was becoming well-known, but he was not a household name by any stretch of the imagination. 1971 saw Bowie signing with Tony Tony DeFries, sorry, and his management team. And Tony DeFries set out to make David Bowie a household name. Bowie would sign a major record deal with RCA out of New York City. From 1971 to 1979, would release a string of albums. Now, before I get into that, Bowie's record deal with RCA stipulated that he had to release two albums a year and release a single every 30 days. Now, if you think about it, for any artist to have to release an album every, uh, two albums every year, sorry, and a single every 30 days to promote, 
That is an insurmountable amount of work. I don't care who the hell you are. It is almost impossible to maintain that level of creativity, and momentum. But he was able to do it. So I'm going to break this down into two parts. From 71 to 73, he released Honky Dory featuring Changes, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, reaching number 75 in the U.S. charts and was, a, I believe, a top 10 hit in the U.K., a major album for Bowie in the U.K. Some would see it as a seminal album for him, uh, containing such songs as Star, Ziggy Stardust, Hang On to Yourself, Soul Love, uh, just an amazing album. He would follow that up with the release of Aladdin Sane in 73, which Boy would describe Aladdin Sane as Ziggy on tour in America, featuring such songs as Watch That Man, the single The Gene Genie, Panic in Detroit, just an amazing album. He would follow up Aladdin Sane with the covers album Pinups, as you can see, with Twiggy on the front cover. This album featured uh, covers from such acts as The Who and Them. The album was seen as a stopgap for Bowie uh, because RCA wanted another album of original material. They wanted to capitalize, capitalize sorry, on the success that Bowie had uh, achieved with the Ziggy Stardust album. In 1974, we saw the release of Diamond Dogs. You also saw the release of Young Americans in 75 and Station to Station in 1976. Okay. Bowie's momentum kept going. With Diamond Dogs, you had the single Rebel Rebel. You also had the single of uh, Young Americans from the album of the same name and the single Fame, co written by John Lennon and Carlos Alomar. And Station to Station was more eclectic in its uh, song content. You had the singles, Golden Years. Also, you had the title track, the 10-minute opus <clears throat> of the same name. And you also had the tracks, TVC Win 5, and also Wild is the Wind. Now, with Young Americans, Boy went into more of a soul R&B vibe on the album. And... It was his first major hit in the U.S. on the charts. From 77 to 79, Bowie collaborated with Brian Eno on three albums that would become known as the Berlin Trilogy. Those albums were Low, Heroes, and Lodger. Low was seen as a pretty much disappointment by RCA. Low featured songs from uh, the soundtrack that he worked on, The Man Who Fell to Earth, which were not used for the soundtrack. Uh, largely instrumental album, very minimal instrumentation, which such songs as, you know, uh, Be My Wife and also Wurzawa, which is my favorite track. The collaboration with Eno would continue again with Heroes in 77, featuring the title track. Other songs of note, first of all, Heroes was a major hit for Bowie. Other songs a note on Heroes are Beauty and the Beast, V2 Schneider, and Joe the Lion. Okay? Amazing work. The album Larger would follow in 1979, featuring the singles DJ, Boys Keep Swinging, uh, Look Back in Anger. Amazing album. Although, compared to Heroes and Low, it would be seen as a bit of a disappointment in terms of, not commercially, but creatively for Bowie, in terms of his work with Eno. 1980 saw a bit of a, a turning point for Bowie. He released the mega-selling Scary Monsters and Super Creeps, featuring the singles Fashion and Ashes to Ashes. Also, other songs of note are It's No Game, Parts 1 and 2, and... Uh, the title track from the album. Now, Ashes to Ashes was a major hit for Bowie. Okay. At this point, after the release of uh, Scary Monsters, he would leave RCA due to his dissatisfaction 
with uh, the promotion that he received from the albums in the later part of his uh, tenure with RCA. In 1982, he signed a deal with EMI America. In 83 comes the left turn with the release of Let's Dance. Now, for this album, he sought out the assistance of Now Rogers. Now Rogers, you know, big record producer, worked with Sister Sledge, also with Sheik. When he approached Now Rogers to work with him, Now Rogers said, Oh, great, you know, I'm going to work with Bowie, you know, fantastic, innovative artist. I'm going to be working, you know, we're going to do cutting edge work. He thought he was going to be doing work that, oh, such as he did on low and you know heroes and bowie sat him down and said listen i want a hit i want to be on the charts i want to be relevant i want a hit so let's dance saw a, a great departure it is a left turn in the canon of david bowie musically speaking featuring such hits as the title track china girl Modern Love, other songs of note are uh, Putting Off Fire, Cat People, from the movie of the same name that he worked with uh, Georgia Marauder on. Also, Ricochet is another track from the album. This album put Bowie in the stratosphere, the pop stratosphere, and he launched the Serious Moon Night Tour. This album was number one on both sides of the Atlantic. It put him in a category that he never thought he would be in, okay? And <clears throat> he would, in later interviews, some would come to regret it, but I'll get into that in a minute. 1994 through 19, 1984, sorry, through 1987, saw the releases of Tonight, his follow-up to Let's Dance, the Labyrinth soundtrack, the collaboration he did with Pat Metheny on This Is Not America for the Falcon and the Snowman soundtrack, and his 1987 release, Never Let Me Down. Okay. He would reflect later on that when he looked back on the releases up tonight and Never Let Me Down, that it annoyed him to his very core that he would let other people do the arrangements on his albums. Okay. Bowie was always a very hands-on artist in terms of his songwriting, arranging, and production. And the fact that he achieved success with Let's Dance, <clears throat> excuse me, but he kind of found himself pigeonholed into a market that he didn't want to be in. He would basically say that he did not want to do that kind of music pop-oriented kind of music anymore. And he felt restricted by the album Let's Dance in retrospect. In the 90s, starting in 19, 1993, he released two albums, Black Tie, White Noise and The Buddha of Suburbia. Black Tie, White Noise and The Buddha of Suburbia were interesting albums, okay? Black Tie, White Noise featured the single uh, Jump They Say, or Jump They Said, sorry, and the title track featuring a duet with Albie Shore, and pretty much The Booty of Suburbia came and went without much notice. It was an, a soundtrack album that David Bowie worked on with David Richards as producer, and he was quite proud of this album, but it pretty much came and went without notice. 1995 through 1999 saw the releases of three albums. Outside, which was more of an industrial style album, concept album, 19 songs, uh, lengthy album, something like 75 minutes in playing time, very heavy album, industrial in terms of uh, music style. Earthling in 1997, which really was more of a electronica type of an album and hours in 1999 which was more of a introspective reflective kind of album more somber with songs like thursday's child 
Earthling would have the songs and uh, the singles Little Wonder and Hello Space Boy. Bowie kept pushing on, okay? He never wanted to stay put in terms of what he did musically. In the 2000s, you saw the release of Heathen in 2001 and Reality in 2003 uh, as a result of his signing a new record deal with Columbia Records and starting his own label, ISO Records. Heathen had the singles uh, Slow Burn, and every, everybody says hi. I loved everybody says hi. I thought it was a fantastic track. And it basically can, had Bowie continuing with what he was doing musically, what he wanted to do musically, I should say. Reality had such songs as New Killer Star, Bring Me the Disco King. And he didn't bark on the reality tour for this album. It would be 10 years before he would release his next album. In 2013, we saw the release of The Next Day, and followed by 2016 of Black Star. Now, The Next Day was seen as more of a heavier, straight out rock album, okay? And uh, pretty much heavy guitar oriented in some spots. There was question about him touring. Is he going to tour? Is he going to tour? And he, at this point, had retired from touring. During the tour for Reality, he basically he suffered a heart attack during the tour. And he pretty much decided that it was time to stop touring, to retire his touring life. 2016, again, saw the release of Black Star released on January 8th, his birthday, 2016. Black Star was seen as a more eclectic album, uh, touching on genres of jazz rock. I don't want to say trip hop, but there are those elements there, uh, featuring seven songs, uh, featuring such singles, uh, songs as, sorry, Tis a Pity She Was a Whore, uh, I Can't Give Everything Away, the last track on the album, which is my favorite track on the album. Bowie would pass away from cancer on January 10th of 2016. Now, getting back to the discussion of Let's Dance and whether or not it was a left turn that felt right. Looking back on Bowie's career, and looking back on his body of work and the eclecticism that pretty much defined his work, I do see as uh, I do see. Sorry, that stands as a left turn that did feel right, because with Bowie, you never knew what he was going to do. You never knew, and that was what was fantastic about David Bowie. Every album was a different chapter. Every album was a different musical avenue. And every album was an adventure. And the fact that he would go from folk to rock, to soul, to avant-garde, you know, to pop, and then jazz rock, it just made it interesting for the rest of us to listen to what he was doing. Obviously, fans came and went over the years, but there was no denying that the body of his work meant that there was no limits to what he did. And yes, with Let's Dance being, you know, an overall pop-oriented album, and yes, <clears throat> um, excuse me, at the end of, you know, during the later part of his career, he would look back on the st at that stance as a left turn that for him didn't feel right in the end. You know what? He is the artist. He has the right to come to that conclusion, you know? But for me, it did fit in with what he was doing musically. So in the end, it did feel right for him to release an album like Let's Dance. <laughs> 
1983. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put down in the comments, down there, down below, what you think of David Bowie as an artist and what you think of Let's Dance. Do you think that Let's Dance was a left turn that felt right to you at the time, or did it not feel right? Again, there are no right or wrong answers, just opinions, right? And that's what we're here for. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining me for this episode. I will be back with episode five in the conclusion of this, I guess you call it a limited series of This Left Turn Feels Right. Uh, Jim Bricker will be joining me for the final episode uh, and we'll be discussing Peter Gabriel and the album So. So please join me for that. That's coming up. And there are more ep episodes in the can that we're going to be talking about and that we're going to be filming. So please stay tuned for that. Please look after yourselves and one another. Please click like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to keep yourselves on top of any new content that I've got coming up. And uh, we'll see you soon with another episode of This Left Turn Feels Right. Bye for now.